Good morning. I thought I would start out by trying to teach all of you, or some of you anyway, a new word. Consilience. This is a good word, and you need to know this word. So consilience, not consiliness, consilience. This word was invented by a man named William Hewell, some of you will know. This is the man who invented the word scientist. Um, if this, this definition with its, all this talk of induction is a bit too intimidating, we can paraphrase this as the unity of knowledge. So, consilience. I must admit that every time I hear somebody mention polyphasic taxonomy, I cringe because polyphasic, to me, means many phases, and the phases in science are gas, liquid, and solid, and I don't like the idea that fungal taxonomy is full of gas. So, <laughs> consilient taxonomy, it's a good word, and I expect that all of you will now start to use it. So, a year ago, uh, Walter Goms and I were standing out on the stairways by the garden there, toasting the publication of this book, The Jenner of Hyphomycetes. And I must say it's really wonderful to be here today to, to be able to congratulate Uwe and Pepe on their books in the same way. That day a huge weight was lifted from my shoulders. And then four months later, dual nomenclature was stripped away to the surprise of, of most of us and to the horror of, of some people. And all of a sudden, 450 pages and 1,400 accepted generic names had to be revised. So if anybody had the right to be irritated by these changes, I think it was me. But I also had to realize that I was one of the major advocates for this change. And so I had a sense of resignation that this job is not quite yet done. So Walter Goms and I have been close friends and close collaborators for decades, and we were on opposite sides of this debate. And last November, Walter sent me this email with these two questions, which I think are the crux of the matter for those of us who consider ourselves hyphomycete taxonomists or anamorph taxonomists. So that leads us to, to my title. So these nomenclatural changes have been interpreted on the one hand as completely destroying anamorph taxonomy, and on the other hand, as inflating the importance of anamorph taxonomy beyond its true significance. So how can both of these things actually be true? We've known for a long time that hyphomycetes is an artificial group, and they share that distinction with a lot of other fungal groups that we study, obviously, the coelomycetes, but the, these uh, groups as well. Many of these groups were considered natural groups for a long time, but as, as molecular phylogenetics came along, we realized that they're, they're polyphyletic. And, uh, but nevertheless, all of these groups have a lot of fans. You, you can go out with field mycologists and you will find people who are proud to call themselves lichenologists or polyporologists or, or gastromycetologists. There's probably only one aphylophorolophologist here, uh, Yost, but um, it seems, on the other hand, somehow that anamorph taxonomy has just been melting away uh, in the past 20 years. So I think that, that we have a lot to learn from the, the taxonomists that have continued to embrace these tax, and we need to figure out how to interest young people to study small things. So if we look at these nomenclatural changes um, and the names that we might lose, we have to think about what are the, these names that we might lose. So this is a list of uh, genera that were described. So the anamorphs uh, on the left and the telomorphs on the right. Um, and these were described by people, the anamorph genera were described by people who already knew that the teleomorph genera exists, so they, they gave them an, uh, these names. So in this system, um, these grayed out names will, will disappear or become, become synonyms. And I want you to look at that list and see if there's any names there in gray that you would actually miss very much. Now, to make, I don't, make it clear that I'm not picking on anybody, those two in blue are names of my own, so that, that uh, will disappear, and I like both those names, but that's okay. I, they're going to disappear for a while. 
And in red are some names of animals that maybe we actually might miss in, in this uh, deletion. Um, and Nimbia in particular, I have to mention, is one of the funniest mycological, my, mycological jokes that's ever made it into the literature. It means it's an English acronym that means not in my backyard. And I think that that's a good uh, uh, symbol for the hyphomycetes sometimes. <laughs> Similarly, this is a list of names of genera, uh, probably not quite complete where the teleomorph genera were described after the anamorph genera, and the people who described these teleomorph names knew that there was an anamorph name already available for those fungi, because they, they discovered a new teleomorph. So again, now in this case, the uh, teleomorph names would, would uh, slide into synonymy with the anamorphs. Um, again, here's a couple that I was involved with, and I must admit that when we described these genera, I had, uh, I had really serious misgivings about doing it because the, the hyphomycete names had a really long history and um, it, it seemed like they deserved to keep that name. In red are a few names that we would normally be losing according to this new interpretation of priority, but uh, maybe we need to reconsider. And the one I'll mention specifically is monolinea, uh, which is, a, which is a, a, an important genus of plant pathogens that shows up on many quarantine lists around the world. And any of you who work in governments know that changing names in legislation is practically impossible. Also, the, the alternate name Manilia has an extremely confused history, and I really can't see any point in, in uh, picking up that name. So nowadays, we look th at fungal classification through a magnifying glass, the phylogenetic magnifying glass that gives us a picture that looks something like this. And the, the names that I've highlighted there in green are the higher taxa that have a high hyphomycete component to them. So I'm in this talk and mostly be focusing on the ascomycete part. There are significant issues in the basidiomycetes, but they tend to be at a lower scale. So even though we now look at fungal taxonomy from a fairly uniform perspective, the history of fungal taxonomy is not uniform. Each taxonomic group was studied by people who had their own assumptions, their own preconceptions, their own procedures and principles that they applied that resulted in the taxonomy and the classification that we have today. And how they dealt with anamorphs was affected by certain aspects of the biology of, of these fungi that they were interested in and in some philosophical preconceptions. Now the biological factors that, that uh, can be important are um, how diverse the anamorphs are in a particular taxonomic group, how commonly they are found, whether they're normally found with a teleomorph or not, whether they grow easily in culture or whether you only see them in culture when you isolate from ascospores. And in some groups, um, they basically ha decided that anamorph phenotypes were entirely um, useless, useless for, for classification, and they focused entirely on the teleomorph phenotype, and sometimes this preconception is justified and sometimes it wasn't. So I think if we look back in history that we, we would see that there would be a tendency that the, the most common morphs would tend to be found first, and then the less common morph would be found afterwards. And so the most common morph would have the first name. And if we preserve that name, continue the use of that name, uh, we'd be more likely to, to, that would be the name that would be used most often in the literature. So in the, in the case where the teleomorph names might disappear, it should be less disruptive to continue using the, the, the anamorph name. Philosophical preconceptions are a bit more difficult to, to deal with, and they do cause a lot of problems now when we're moving into this era of, of uh, one-name nomenclature. The one-to-one -one generic concept, which was uh, promoted about a, a decade ago, um, promoted the idea of consilience between anamorph and teleomorph taxonomies. Um, so one anamorph genus equals one teleomorph genus. 
As a result, there have been a, a fair number of redundant anamorph and teleomorph generic names proposed. At the same time, there have been other taxonomic groups that deliberately uh, did not change the delimitations of the, of the genera to, to correlate in this way. So you'll have, in some groups, uh, one anamorph genus that covers an entire family or an entire order. In some groups, anamorphs have been regarded as ecological adaptations. So in that case, they're regarded more as an organ or a tissue of the fungus that, that exists for an ecological purpose. And in those cases, the generic concepts have deliberately been left polyphyletic. So quickly, I'm just going to go through uh, these six groups of uh, of ascomycetes where I, I think uh, we can use to illustrate many of these problems. And the first uh, group I'm going to mention briefly is the sordariomycetes. This is the uh, group that we used to call the artificial taxon, the polyphyletic ta taxon, the pyrenomycetes. Amy will talk about the hypocryales tomorrow, and if we twist her arm, um, she'll talk about magnaporthales, but we'll have to tw twist. Uh, for the Ophiostomatales, Mike Wingfield's student, uh, Willem de Beer, has put together a nomenclator that will be published soon that will give us a good uh, starting point for that group. For the Sordariales, Ketosphereales, and the Xylariales, however, I think we're gonna, we have some serious work ahead of us. These are, are groups that have had a fairly um, uh, different approaches to anamorph, anamorphs in their taxonomy. And I think each, each group will need to be handled by a separate uh, discussion group. The erodiomycetes, what we used to call the plectomycetes, includes three groups that have a lot of hyphomycetes in them. Uh, the Herpotrichial ACE is one of the groups that I mentioned that where the anamorphs have been regarded as ecological entities and most of the anamorph genera are polyphyletic. So there's going to need to be some serious work there. The Anigenales is the group where the anamorph genera more or less correlate with families. So th there's a disconnect there that will need to be dealt with. Now, two, those two groups are both um, medically important fungi. They're uh, qu quite important on quarantine lists and things like that. So there's going to have to be very close coordination with the uh, medical mycology community on those. And the trichocomacy, uh, Dr. P uh, Dr. Hawksworth mentioned already, um, um, this, this is the, a real hyphomycete group for Penicillium aspergillus. And uh, the, uh, the ICPA, the International Commission on Penicillium and Aspergillus, already has a good running start on getting a list together for that group. The Dothidiomycetes, there's a, a large anam anamorphic component to that. I'm not an expert. Um, but um, in particular, we can look at, at a, a group like the Pleosporales, um, where even within this one family, we have two groups that have quite a different cultural approach to the animals. So in the Altenaria clade, it's predominantly a hyphomycetous kind of clade. Uh, whereas in the Cochleobulus group, there's quite well-developed um, taxonomies of both the anamorph and teleomorph. These three orders of the discomycetes, um, they have Traditionally, the taxonomists of this group have more or less ignored the anamorphs. Um, but as we sequence more, we're starting to see more and more of these described anamorph genera falling into these groups. So this is an area where there's uh, the potential for considerable disruption. There is a relatively active group of amateurs who are interested in, in discomycetes, and they're not going to be happy if their beloved teleomorph names are knocked off the table by what they would consider to be academic anamorph names. The Sclerotiniaceae is one group, I think, where, where we will have to be fairly proactive because these are important plant pathogens. And I, as for my own prejudice, I'll just point out that I really hope that we'll be able to keep botrytis because it's an older name anyway. But Botryotinia has been uh, used in the literature a lot, usually in association. To, this is the teleomorph of botrytis. For a final thought, I'd like to, to leave this quote from the... Uh, preamble to the code about when it's appropriate to change a name. And I've highlighted something there, the more profound knowledge of the facts. Now, the, the people who predict chaos from this process are afraid of, of uh, automated 
nomenclature. They're afraid of naive users of databases who don't understand taxonomic history or taxonomic nuances. They're afraid of a mechanical nomenclature that contains more errors than accuracies. And to be honest, they're also afraid of taxonomy by committee. One way we can address these fears is by remembering this idea of a profound knowledge of the facts. So I, I have a proposal that's perhaps an addendum to what David suggests. I'd like to suggest that we, we try to acknowledge this idea of the profound knowledge, uh, the profound additional facts, and let today's mycologists clean up their own nests. Notice I said nests and not messes. Um, it wasn't a mess. Everybody did this with the best of intentions. And I think the benefit for doing this is that we would let the experts be the experts, let them look after their own canon of names. And uh, I started trying to do this with my own stuff, and I'll show you an example or two this afternoon. And that leaves us back where we started with the big picture of consilience, the unity of taxonomic knowledge. Nomenclature, taxonomy, phylogeny, classification, identification, and beyond. Taxonomic consilience, it's what our colleagues, our users, our granting agencies, and our employers expect of us. Thank you.